Welcome to the officer training video series for officer candidates at Westminster Presbyterian Church in Roanoke, Virginia. Our hope and prayer as we begin this officer training series is that you will be greatly edified, that you will grow in your knowledge of scripture, your knowledge of theology, your knowledge of the fundamentals and basics of the Christian faith, and that you will grow to be more like Christ. However, we have to give one important disclaimer as we begin this officer training series, and that is that simply watching these videos does not necessarily qualify you to be an officer at Westminster or in Christ's church in general, nor does watching these videos guarantee that you will ever serve as an officer at Westminster. However, these videos are intended to provide the basics, the fundamentals of the Christian faith, the fundamentals of theology, the fundamentals of holiness. In that sense, this is not a video series only for officers. This is a video series for all Christians who are interested in growing to be more like Christ and growing in Christian maturity. The Book of Church Order for the Presbyterian Church in America reminds us that when it comes to officers in Christ's church, all those duties which private Christians are bound to discharge by the law of love are especially incumbent upon them, upon officers, by divine vocation, and are to be discharged as official duties. In that sense, the content that you find in these videos, as it relates specifically to officers, and as it relates to theology and the basics and fundamentals of the Christian faith, are not necessarily official duties of every Christian, but at the same time, Christians are bound to discharge them by the law of love. In that sense, then, all the information that is found in these videos is important for all Christians, as we are going through the basic fundamentals of what it means to be a part of Christ's church, what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be a follower after Jesus Christ. The content in these videos is required, or as BCO 8-3 says here, are to be discharged as official duties, but generally everything in these videos is important for all believers. The first topic to be addressed in this officer training video series is the topic of Scripture, as we lay a fundamental foundation for how we live the Christian faith. We ask ourselves, what is Scripture? How do we define Scripture? What is Scripture all about? And is Scripture reliable? Can we actually believe what it says? There's also the fundamental questions of where Scripture came from and how we know which books are scriptural. And then more importantly, how do we interpret Scripture? And, especially for officers who must be apt to teach, how do we teach Scripture? How do we pass its content on to others? We'll be considering these and other questions in the slides to come. The first question to ask ourselves as we consider Scripture is, what is Scripture? Scripture, or at least the word in English, comes from the Latin word scriptura, which means the act or product of writing. The revelation of God in Scripture is, by its very definition, written. It is written down for us to be able to read. However, there are other words that we also use to describe that revelation, besides the fact that it is written, words like inspired and inerrant, so that we can say that Scripture, by definition, is God's inspired, inerrant, special written revelation. And in the following videos, we'll explain what each of those terms mean. What does it mean that God's word is special? Before we explain how scripture is the special revelation of God, let's answer the question, what is scripture about? The Westminster Confession of Faith puts it well in its first chapter when it says that scripture is the whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for his own glory, for man's salvation, faith, and life, and that it is either expressly set down in Scripture, that is, that it is clearly found in Scripture, or by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from Scripture. In other words, the whole counsel of God, as it has been revealed to us in Scripture, is all the things that are necessary, those things that we need to know about God and about ourselves, about God and his plan of salvation, about us and our sin and our need for salvation. All of those things are clearly revealed in Scripture, as well as what it is that God requires of us, His law, and what we may deduce about His law are all set down in Scripture. This is what Scripture is primarily about. However, there's one more characteristic of what Scripture is about that I must point out, and that is that all Scripture is ultimately telling us about a single message, and really not even a single message, but a single person. 
all of Scripture in both the Old Testament and the New Testament is ultimately and fundamentally about Jesus Christ. Christ himself said that the law and the prophets look ahead to him. All of the Old Testament expects, predicts, promises, looks forward to, longs, needs Jesus Christ, looks ahead to his first advent, whereas the New Testament tells us about the first advent and looks ahead to the second advent. All of Scripture tells us about what it is that God requires of us, and all of Scripture tells us that there will be one who will actually accomplish what God requires of us, that person being Jesus Christ, who will be perfect and will sacrifice himself for the sins of his people, because we are not perfect. All the Old Testament expects a Savior, expects a Redeemer, and expects a King. The New Testament tells us that that Redeemer has come, that Savior has come, that King has come, and then tells us how then we shall live because of the first advent of that Savior. Christ has come. Christ has given us his Holy Spirit. Christ has reascended to the Father. And now we are longing for him to come back again and fully complete everything that has begun. So all of Scripture, both old and new, are ultimately about Christ. That's all well and good, but we may be faced with the question, why not start with the theology of God? Why are we starting with the theology of Scripture? Why not even start with the theology of Jesus Christ, with our salvation, understanding that we have been redeemed from sin? Why not start with sin? Why not start with the fall? Why not start with creation? Why do we start with Scripture? Well, the answer is, how would we know about any of those things? How would we know about theology proper? How would we know about God? How would we know about any of that if we did not have Scripture? You see, the fact is that there is information, much information, that is included in the written revelation of God that is simply not found anywhere else. That's why we refer to Scripture as the special revelation of God, as opposed to natural revelation. Natural revelation is great, but it is special revelation, special written revelation, that tells us who God is what God requires of us, that tells us about Christ. If we didn't have that, we wouldn't be able to have any of these discussions that we're going to have in this training because we'd have no way to know. Natural revelation, although it is important and although it tells us about God, is simply insufficient to tell us everything that we need to know. That's why Romans 1 and the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 1, statement 1, reminds us that although the light of nature... And the works of creation and providence do so far manifest the goodness, the wisdom, the power of God, as to leave man unexcusable. We know there's a God. And yet, that natural revelation is not sufficient to give that knowledge of God and of his will, which is necessary unto salvation. Therefore, it pleased the Lord at sundry times and in diverse manners to reveal himself and declare that his will unto his church and afterwards, for the better in preserving and propagating of the truth, and for the more sure establishment and comfort of the church against the corruption of the flesh, the malice of Satan in the world, to commit the same unto holy writing, which makes the Holy Scripture to be most necessary, those former ways of God's revealing his will unto his people now being ceased. The revelation of God, the written revelation, the special written revelation of God, is necessary there is information that we need to know that is found only in Scripture. There is a necessity for the revelation of God in this particular form. We notice here in this last statement that God no longer reveals himself through prophets. He no longer reveals himself through dreams and visions, as we're reminded in Hebrews chapter 1. Instead, God has revealed all things in Christ and has revealed all things in his written word. We have the written revelation of God to tell us the things that we need to know, to tell us about him, to tell us about salvation, to tell us about our sin, and ultimately to tell us about Christ. So how exactly did we get scripture? We know that scripture is necessary, and we know that we clearly have it. We know what it's about, but how did we get it? This is the doctrine of inspiration. The Westminster Confession of Faith says that Scripture was immediately inspired by God. What it means by that is that the authors of Scripture were themselves inspired by God. This was not somewhere down the line, somebody somewhere was inspired, but that it was immediately inspired, that God inspired the person who put the words on the page. We also talk about verbal 
plenary inspiration. What we mean by that is that the words themselves are inspired. It's not just the idea. It's not just the theology. The word choice itself is inspired. Plenary is just a fancy word that means all. Every word in the entire Bible is inspired. It's not just some words. It's not just some ideas. All of it is inspired. As we're reminded in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God-breathed. Literally, all scripture is God-spirited. It is God-breathed out. God is the one who inspired it. God is the one who caused it to be written, and God is the one who guided that written process. This doctrine of inspiration is confirmed by passages such as Acts 28.25, but the Apostle Paul says that the Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet. Isaiah was the one that was writing, and yet the Holy Spirit was the one who was inspiring Isaiah to write. 1 Peter 1.12 says, Men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the agent of God's inspiration. A person does not receive God's word necessarily by dictation, not necessarily by finding something that God wrote, we do know that God wrote the Ten Commandments with his own hand. We know that God dictated to Jeremiah and dictated in other places what exactly was specifically supposed to be written. But in most cases, in many cases, it was through inspiration that the Holy Spirit moved in such a way that the person who was writing was inspired to write. 1 Peter 1.12 singles out men, but we know of at least one instance where a woman actually is the source of a particular scripture. Uh, we know from the book of Proverbs that King Lemuel's mother, she taught him that proverb that his, has his name on it, as he even gives her credit, a proverb I learned from my mother. She was inspired to write those words, or she was inspired to speak those words, and King Lemuel was inspired to record those words. But the idea is still the same. The Holy Spirit is the one who carries them along, who enables them to speak for him to write down these words of Scripture as we have it today. Of course, if humans wrote the Bible, is the Bible reliable? If it was dictated by God, we would certainly say, well, yes, of course, God's the one who wrote it. But the fact that it comes through human beings many times makes us uncomfortable because human beings are prone to error. We read in the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 1.8, by his singular care, by God's singular care and providence. Scripture has been kept pure in all ages and is therefore authentical. It is what God intended to write. Many times we see human beings as a filter, we'll call it a blue filter, over a white light, the white light being God's Holy Spirit telling them what to write, so that what comes out on the paper is not the white light of the Spirit, but a tainted blue light. However, we're assuming that that meant that God wanted to have white light, but that's not the case. If God wanted to simply have white light on the paper, he would have simply left mankind out of it. But God wanted that blue light of human vocabulary, human personality, human writing style. So that's why he used inspiration. He inspired those authors to write what they wrote. The Holy Spirit carried them along and caused them to write. So is it a blue light on the paper? Sure, but that's how God wanted it. He wanted blue light on the paper. We ask ourselves, well, does that mean there's no errors because God is the one who preserved it? And yes, that is exactly what we mean. However, it doesn't mean that there are no errors whatsoever in the process of copying Scripture. We know that it is pure and has been preserved by very serious scholars throughout the ages, but there are errors, per se, that have crept into the text, whether they be errors of repeating the same letter over and over again or leaving letters out. But there is nothing within the pages of Scripture that has been changed that actually affects anything about our doctrine. So we can have complete confidence in this process of inspiration. God is completely involved. God is the one inspiring. He is the source of Scripture. And yet at the same time understand that it came through human beings. It is a human document, it has human personality, and it reads like a human story. That's how God wanted it. He inspired these human authors to write a human work. If you think about it, that means that written revelation is very similar to living revelation. The written word, which is found in Scripture, is very similar to the living word, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. 
both the written word and the living word are 100% divine. Christ is the Son of God. The written word is inspired by God. Both are also 100% human. The living word, Jesus Christ, is 100% man. Written word, the written scripture, is also 100% man. As human beings write down what it is that they are told or what it is that they are inspired to write. And yet, at the same time, the written word of God, as it was first originally written before copying errors came in, it was 100% perfect, just as Christ is 100% perfect. Even now, as we have transmitted the written word of God over several centuries, in fact, over several millennia, the word of God is still 99.999% accurate. And the few errors that have crept in in terms of how we have copied it in our manuscripts over the last several millennia is of little significance. It does not affect the meaning of the text at all. We have complete confidence that God has preserved his word through the ages, as the Westminster Confession of Faith says. The word of God is providentially under the control of God, and God has assured its purity, assuring that it continues to give us that special, necessary, inspired revelation. Let's talk just a moment about Scripture's human source. We know that at some point the books of the Bible were collected by men. Proverbs chapter 25 verse 1 tells us this explicitly, that the men of Hezekiah collected the Proverbs of Solomon. The five books of Psalms probably traveled separately, which explains why there is a duplication of a psalm from book 1 into book 2, but at some point the five books were put together to create a single collection. We know that the minor prophets were eventually written onto a single scroll. So we know that collection work took place so that by the time of Christ, the books of the Old Testament were understood to be what they are today. We also know from the New Testament, especially passages like 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16, as he refers to Paul and the other scriptures, that even in the time when the apostles were still alive, they understood which books were scriptural and which books were not. We have the Muratorian Canon, which is a collection of New Testament books in a single list, it's written in Latin, but appears to be a translation of a Greek list that probably traveled around 170 or 180 AD. This particular list of books is very similar to what we have today. Hebrews, James, and several other minor letters like 1 Peter, 2 Peter, 3 Peter are not included in the Muratorian canon, but over time, these books would be added as well. So even by 170 AD, we have a list that is very similar to the list that we have today. Already the Apocrypha and the Pseudepigrapha, uh, the Apocrypha being the books that show up in the Catholic Bible, the Pseudepigrapha being books that were written much later than the time of Christ, probably 200, 300 AD, and are rejected by both the Protestant and the Catholic Church, those books had already been eliminated from the potential list of books. The New Testament era had ended, and the writers of the New Testament books had passed away, but their followers understood that their books were inspired. They understood that there was a connection to apostles or an apostolic source. For instance, tradition says that Mark used Peter as a source, even though Mark himself was not an apostle. They understood that when Jesus said, you are my witnesses, that he was giving the apostles the authority almost as the power of attorney, to write down the teachings of the New Testament church, the teachings of Christ. So we have this understanding as to what are the authoritative books of the Old and New Testaments. We also have these confirmed by the Masoretes, who confirmed the writings of the Old Testament, since in about 1000 AD they put together the books of the Old Testament into a series of scrolls, all very similar to each other in terms of their spelling, having added in pronunciation marks as well as adding in the vowel markings so that the Old Testament text could be read in Hebrew. The order of the books is slightly different from what we have in, the, in our Old Testaments today, and yet the same number of books and the same books are present in the Masoretic text. The Masoretic text is actually the Hebrew text most commonly used in seminaries and churches today. We also have numerous papyri, uh, the various uh, papyruses, although the technical word is papyri, but each of these papyruses were put together and formed our New Testament so that we still have an incredible amount of textual evidence of the uh, content of the New Testament that we can go back and rely upon. Many of those texts are extremely ancient, 
One of the oldest copies that we have is John, a small fragment of John, and yet it may be a copy of the original or a copy of a copy of the original. It's that old. Papyri, unfortunately, uh, fade away over time and, and become brittle and can break. But we have discoveries of papyri, like the Dead Sea Scrolls, that continue to confirm what we have in our Bibles. So we know that at some point it was all collected. And yet even that process, as we've already seen, has been superimposed by God. God was involved in that process, not only inspiring the books, but also directing those who were putting the books together into the Bible as we have it today. As we talk about the source of Scripture, though, we have to keep in mind where does the authority of the Bible come from? A good way to put this is, do we have an authoritative collection of books in the sense that somebody has served as the authority to say, these are the books of the Bible? This is often considered the Catholic view. The Catholics understand that the Church, specifically the Pope, but the councils, had the authority to determine these are the books of the Bible. Or, in the Protestant view, do we have a collection of authoritative books, that the books themselves are authoritative, and we're simply recognizing the authority that they already have? The Westminster Confession, chapter 1.4, answers this question by saying that we have a collection of authoritative books. The authority of the Holy Scripture, for which it ought to be believed and obeyed, depends not upon the testimony of any man or the Church, with a capital C. The Church is not the authority, but wholly upon God, who is truth itself, the author thereof, and therefore it is to be received because it is the Word of God. Scripture's authority comes from Scripture itself. This is a crucial division between the Protestant Church and the Catholic Church, especially after the Reformation. That as we talk about sola scriptura, it's not just that we're rejecting church authority, we're rejecting church authority over Scripture. Scripture is the authority over the church. Scripture is the only authority of rule and practice. As we talk about Scripture's source, we also have to ask about the reliability of Scripture. Because we say, often, that Scripture is inspired in its original autographs. It's inerrant in its original autographs. What we mean by that is that when Scripture was originally written down, when it was put on that manuscript for the very first time, the text was completely pure, completely without error, completely inspired. However, that that particular manuscript was then passed on to later generations, copied, recopied again and again and again. And we wonder, well, how reliable is the text as we have it today? How much corruption has crept into the text? Well, we know of many instances where corruption has crept into the text, where things have been added, things have been left out, where we have things that have actually been copied twice, where sometimes a scribe will try to smooth out the reading of a particular text to make it seem a little better. In fact, within the Old Testament, the Masoretes would actually indicate at least ten times where they deliberately changed the text because they were uncomfortable with what it was saying. For instance, in Genesis chapter 18, it says that the Lord stood before Abraham. The Masoretes were uncomfortable with that, so they changed it to Abraham standing before the Lord. Theologically, they just thought it didn't fit. They were kind enough to mark the times when they actually changed it, so we know where they have made the change, and we know why they made the change. But we still know that a change has been made. We know, especially as we compare various manuscripts, that even in the New Testament, there are some 10,000 textual questions, some 10,000 differences. Almost 90% of those are the difference between you, plural, and us, plural, uh, just being the difference of one letter in Greek. In most cases, it makes absolutely no difference to the reading of the text, and in no cases does it affect the theology and teaching of the text. It's just a question of make our joy complete or make your joy complete. What's the difference? One letter in Greek. One thing that helps, though, with the confidence that we have in the transmission of Scripture, besides the teaching of Scripture that God is watching over it and guiding its purity, is that we have other manuscripts in other languages, besides the manuscripts that we use for our particular translation of the Bible. For instance, we translate the Old Testament Hebrew into English, but we also have the Septuagint, which is written in Greek and is written probably 100 to 200 years before the time of Christ. 
We also have Targums, which are written in Aramaic and are written 100 to 200 years after the time of Christ, that tell us this is what was in the Hebrew text as they're looking at it. Now, we know that there are some differences by looking at the Septuagint, and yet we also know that 99% of what we have in the Old Testament is exactly what they had in the Septuagint. We also have the Dead Sea Scrolls that were discovered in the 1940s and the 1950s. These particular manuscripts are over 2,000 years old, and they confirm what we have in our Bibles. When we notice that there's a difference, though, we use what's called textual criticism. And by textual criticism, we are attempting to look at the particular manuscript and figure out the correct reading. Now, there are two different perspectives on textual criticism. Sometimes there's what is called the received text or the textus receptus. Basically, the reading in a particular manuscript that is most common is the one that makes us into the Bible. So if, for instance, we had 10 manuscripts with one reading and one manuscript with a different reading, the text that we would use would be the 10. This is the basis of translation for the New King James and the King James Version, the Textus Receptus. There is another type of textual criticism, though, that is called conceived textual criticism. This is one that evaluates not so much which reading is more popular in terms of how many manuscripts we have, but which one fits the text the best. In fact, in some cases, we actually use the textual reading that is most difficult because of the understanding that the scribe would be more likely to make it easier than to deliberately make it more confusing. So many times as we're using logic and as we're using human reason, we're able to recreate the text through conceived textual criticism. This is the more popular form of textual criticism that we find in the English Standard Version and the New International Version. We do have many translations. Uh, we have the Geneva Bible, which was uh, from Calvin's day. Uh, the King James Version was originally written to get rid of Calvin's footnotes, his pro-Reformation footnotes that were in the Geneva Bible. And so the King James Version was, uh, uh, was told to be written by King James, although he himself did not write it. The New King James has taken the Old King James and has used better manuscripts, and so has updated the text. We also have the Revised Standard Version, which is a descendant from the King James Version. And we have the English Standard Version that is a descendant of the Revised Standard Version. So the English Standard Version actually goes all the way back to the King James Version, with that King James type language being taken out, and yet the readability of the King James Version and the translation of the King James Version is very much present in the ESV, although the English Standard Version uses a conceived textual criticism rather than the Textus Receptus or the most common reading as the King James Version. That is why in the King James Version you will read, For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever in the Lord's Prayer, and yet in the ESV and the NIV that is not present, because the oldest manuscripts do not have it. Lots of more recent manuscripts do have it, which is why it shows up in the King James Version. We also have the New American Standard, which is a very wooden or very literal translation from the Hebrew and the Greek into English. And we have the New International Version that uses a process called dynamic equivalence that tries to carry the same idea from the text, but is not necessarily word for word. It's not a paraphrase, but a dynamic equivalence. So while the ESV may say denarii, the NIV may say a day's wages, giving us the sense of what a denarii is rather than using the word itself. We have great, great confidence in our translations. We understand that the original language is better, which is why we teach our pastors Hebrew and Greek. In fact, why we encourage everyone to learn Hebrew and Greek so that they can read the original manuscripts as we have them in the original languages and see where we get our various translations. And yet at the same time, our translations have been done by some incredibly gifted men and women that have put together these English translations for us using different types of textual criticism, relying upon the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Septuagint and the Targums and the Peshitta and various other translations from the ancient world of the Hebrew text and various translations even in Latin of the New Testament text. And so we're able to rely upon these translations and use them with great confidence, knowing that what we have is indeed an accurate English translation of the Word of God. Now that we've understood where Scripture comes from, how do we interpret Scripture? How do we determine what scripture means? Well, the answer is simply context. Context, context, 
context. As the Westminster Confession says in chapter 1.9, the infallible rule of interpretation of Scripture is the Scripture itself. And therefore, when there is a question about the true and full sense of any Scripture, which is not manifold but one, it must be searched and known by other places that speak more clearly. Context, context, context. Scripture interprets Scripture. The old Reformers used to call this the rule of faith. Here it's called the infallible rule of interpretation. Context is king. Context, context, context. Context determines how we interpret Scripture. We must consider the context or else we risk interpreting it incorrectly the same way as the previous slide showed with the trailer for the movie Mary Poppins. Mary Poppins, of course, is not a horror film. So how do we interpret scripture given its context? Well, there are many different types of context. There's historical context. We have to look at scripture in the time in which it is written. It is written to a particular audience at a particular time, and it must be considered within that context not just within our context in terms of application, but in terms of its original context. How would the original writers and the original readers have understood what was written? We also have literary context, the surrounding books, the surrounding chapters, the surrounding verses, looking at it within the context of metaphor, within the context of figurative speech, within the context of genre. How do we consider the text within that particular context? There's also the cultural context, what culture is it written in? Is it written to a Gentile audience? Is it written to a Jewish audience? Is it written in exile with Babylonian influence, Assyrian influence? Or is it written in Jerusalem with a kingly influence? Cultural context matters. There's also the structural context, the actual syntax, the verbs, the nouns, the adjectives, the adverbs, as all of that goes together, and the immediate context. What is the context of the passage that's being described at that point? Sometimes people will say, based on the scripture verse, God is willing that none should perish, that God wants everybody to be saved, in the sense that God has left it up to our free choice to decide who is going to be saved and who is not. However, within the immediate context of that passage in Peter, the context is actually Peter assuring people that God is patiently waiting for all whom he has chosen to come to repentance. It's not about all people, it's about all chosen people all God's people. Looking at it in its proper context helps us interpret that particular scripture appropriately. Context. Context is king. A passage must be examined within its context. I've already covered two of the key principles of biblical interpretation, known as the science of hermeneutics. However, there are two more important principles. Not only does scripture interpret scripture, not only is context king, but we also deal with the sensus literalis, that is, we deal with the most straightforward interpretation of the text as it is presented to us within the canon of the Bible. We're not looking for special secret meaning, we're not looking for number code, we're not looking for secret allegories, we're looking for the plain sense of scripture. And closely tied to that is the idea of perspicuity, which is a big fancy term that means clear. Try not to think too much about the irony of using an unclear term to explain a clear idea, but that is what perspicuity means. Clear. Scripture is clear. Now, that doesn't mean that everything in Scripture is easy. It doesn't mean that everything is simplistic. 
For instance, E equals MC squared is actually a very straightforward mathematical principle. However, when you delve into Einstein's theory of relativity, you realize it is anything but simplistic. It might be clear, it might be simple, it might have a literal sense, but it can still be challenging. The same is true with scripture. Scripture is clear. Scripture has a literal sense to it. And yet there are still passages that we wrestle with. But we need to be careful as we're examining scripture within its context, within the context and the greater idea of all of scripture, as scripture interprets scripture, that we're not trying to be a little too fancy with the text. The text means what it means. And most of the time, that's going to be very straightforward and easy to understand. We need to be careful that we don't go beyond that, making scripture say something that it was never intended to say. A helpful way to examine the actual interpretation of scripture then is using a target, or sometimes this is described as ripples in a stream after you drop a pebble in. We start in the center and we work our way out. We start with the immediate context, the immediate cultural context, the immediate literary context, the immediate, immediate context of what's going on in that particular passage. Then we expand out to look at the rest of the chapter. Then we look at the rest of the book. Then we look at the rest of that section, that genre of scripture. Then we look at the rest of that testament, and finally we look at all of scripture together. In this way, we're able to focus our interpretation of scripture into its proper context. So again, if you take nothing else from this, remember, we interpret scripture within its context. Once we have understood what scripture meant in its original context, we're now ready to teach that passage, applying it to our day to day. We need to ask ourselves several questions, such as how does this particular text fit into the big story of redemption from Genesis through Revelation? How does it teach us about Christ and him crucified? How does it fit into God's plan of salvation that is revealed in all of scripture? And then ultimately, how does this passage call us to live, either in light of Christ, in faith in Christ, calling us to repentance for our sin as it shows us our sin, or calling us to respond in a pursuit of holiness as we understand what Christ has done for us and as we look forward to what Christ is doing and will do for us in the future. This particular part of the text has often been described as visiting another village. You visit a village and you hear the message in that village. You then cross the river of time on a bridge, perhaps, which is the lesson that you're teaching, into your current village. You're then explaining the meaning of that message that came from the other village in terms that your village will understand. The Old Testament, obviously, did not mention cars, so the idea of speeding would have been contrary to their understanding. However, within our context, we understand that honoring our father and mother, obeying all God-given authority, involves following the speed limit. So this is bringing the text from its original context and original meaning not changing the meaning, but changing the application, explaining how that meaning of obeying authority applies today. At the same time, though, understanding that we don't always do that, thus we need to repent. We need forgiveness through Jesus Christ, so that we see both how that particular text affects our days today in terms of how we should live, but also affects the big story of redemption, as we see what God is doing because Israel did not keep the Ten Commandments. The idea of teaching scripture can be very intimidating, but there is help. In fact, not just help, there is the key to teaching scripture, and that is reliance upon the power of the Holy Spirit. We are talking here about illumination, not revelation. Revelation is scripture. God has already revealed himself in written form. He's no longer revealing himself. Even as we read earlier in the Westminster Confession of Faith that all other forms of revelation have now ceased, now that the canon has been set, now that scripture is sufficient for what we need for faith and practice. However, the Holy Spirit illumines our hearts and our minds, enlightens us, helps us to understand what has been revealed to us. So as we're teaching, we are teaching in reliance upon the power of the Holy Spirit, Understanding that the Holy Spirit has to help someone understand, or they will never understand. As 1 Corinthians chapter 2 tells us, we are teaching spiritual things to spiritually minded people by the power of the Spirit. That is our reliance. That doesn't mean that we're lazy. That doesn't mean that we do no preparation. But it does mean that ultimately our faith goes back to God, 
Our trust is that God, by his spirit, is going to apply scripture to our lives, is going to help us to understand, is going to work in our hearts and our minds through the power of scripture to transform our lives. That is our confidence as we teach, not in our personal ability, not in our winsomeness, not in our wisdom or our smarts, but in the power of the Holy Spirit. We seek to be faithful in preparation, but our ultimate faith lies in God. Ultimately, a good outline for teaching is explanation, illustration, application. Explain the text in its original context. Explain that meaning. Then illustrate that meaning. Perhaps your audience doesn't quite understand what that meaning means since they don't live in that culture. So it's illustrated. It's explained, but also illustrated. It's demonstrated what it means today. And then it's applied to our immediate context. How does it apply to us today? both in that story of redemption, but in how we should live. Explain it, illustrate it, apply it. Sometimes, in general, it's good to begin with an illustration in your initial lesson, a hook to get people's attention, to explain to them why what you're about to say is important, perhaps illustrating for them some common foible or failure of the human race and our need for a savior, and showing us how this particular text answers that question. Well, that brings us to the end of this particular training lesson. Hopefully you have found this uh, informative and valuable and helpful. Whether you're going to be an officer in teaching in Christ's church, whether you're going to be serving as a Sunday school teacher, or whether you're simply going to be teaching your own children. Hopefully you have a deeper understanding of scripture, where it comes from, how we interpret it, and how we teach it.